The difference in electronegativity between two bonded atoms is a measure of the polarity of the bond. B and A are chosen so that the difference in electronegativity is positive. If the electronegativity difference is zero, the bond is nonpolar. If the electronegativity difference is greater than zero, the bond is polar. So we are asked to determine the electronegativity differences for the bonds in chloroacetic acid. We have for carbon an electronegativity of 2.55. And for oxygen, we have an electronegativity of 3.44. The difference here, delta E n, is equal to 0 0.89. So for the two carbon-oxygen bonds, the difference in electronegativity is 0 0.89, making this bond polar. Please pause the video and determine the electronegativity difference for the remaining bonds in chloroacetic acid. What you should have calculated is that the carbon-hydrogen bonds have a difference in electronegativity of 0 0.35. The carbon-chlorine bond has an electronegativity difference of 0 0.61. The carbon-carbon bond has an electronegativity difference of zero, and the oxygen-hydrogen bond has an electronegativity difference of 1.24. With the exception of the carbon-carbon bond, all of the other bonds are polar. Note that the oxygen-hydrogen bond has the greatest electronegativity difference. This bond has the greatest ionic character and is also the bond that breaks as part of the acid nature of chloroacetic acid. While it is possible to calculate the electronegativity difference for each bond, we can't isolate the individual bond polarities. We can only measure the net result of all of these polar bonds, which is called the dipole moment. The dipole moment exists because the protons and electrons have different properties within molecular entities. Protons are localized to the nuclei. The valence electrons are localized in bonding regions and around electronegative atoms. If the average of all of the protons is in a different location than the average of all of the electrons, then the entity has a dipole moment. Here are three different entities. In hydrogen, both atoms are the same and attract the electrons the same. The center of positive charge and center of negative charge are in the same location. In chlorine, both atoms are still the same but more electronegative. They still have the same electronegativity and attract the electrons the same. Again, the center of positive charge and center of negative charge are in the same location. It is only when we bond different atoms with different electronegativities that things change. In HCl, the chlorine atom is more electronegative and draws the valence electrons closer to itself. The center of positive charge and center of negative charge are in different locations, with the center of negative charge being closer to the chlorine atom. We have already learned about core and valence electrons. The core electrons are localized to each atom, the valence electrons are involved in bonding and contribute to the dipole moment. The dipole moment is a measure of the distance between the positive and negative charge centers. Now for something important, but slightly humorous. If you are planning to go into engineering, physics, or physical chemistry, you will learn the mathematics behind moments and will confirm that the dipole moment is a vector 
from the negative to positive charge centers. If you go into organic chemistry, the arrow is drawn in the other direction. I don't know why, it just is. We previously calculated the difference in electronegativity between carbon and oxygen at 0 0.89. The experimental dipole moment in carbon monoxide is 0 0.11 Debye. Debye are the common units for dipole moment, but not something that you will need to be able to work with. Now pause the video and determine the dipole moment in carbon dioxide. The dipole moment is zero. Why is that the case? Because both carbon-oxygen bonds are polar. The reason is that the individual bond dipoles cancel. The key point is that symmetry affects the dipole moment. Symmetry exists when an entity can be rotated or flipped and the result is identical to the original. If an entity is symmetric, the bond dipoles will cancel. Bond dipoles cancel if the geometry is one of linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, octahedral, or square planar. This shows the progression from BF3 to BH3. Both BF3 and BH3 have zero dipole moment because they are trigonal planar with all terminal atoms being the same. However, HBF2 and H2BF have a dipole moment as shown. The same exists for the progression from CCL4 to CH4. However, it is slightly more difficult to see in these images because of the tetrahedral geometry. In these figures, red indicates regions of high electron density and blue indicates regions of low electron density. Take a minute to look at these images and understand the electron distribution. As a hint, consider the electronegativity of the atoms. This concludes our exploration of classical bonding. I'm going to conclude with an analysis of the Lewis-Vesper model. Firstly, the Lewis-Vesper model is classical. It treats electrons as particles. However, the Lewis-Vesper model is good it was designed to and correctly predicts the bonding, shape, and charge distribution of the vast majority of S and P block entities. It predicts the distortion from the ideal bond angles and predicts the charge distributions from the electronegativity differences. The Lewis Vesper model does have limitations. It is not designed to provide information on bond energies, bond lengths, stability, reactivity, etc. As long as we know where we can use the Lewis model, it works well. However, there are times when the Lewis Vesper model fails. Failure is a problem. The model should work, but diff does not. While this is a long list, it applies to relatively few entities. Looking at the first one, we can actually answer that from our understanding of quantum mechanics. Looking at oxygen, we have always drawn oxygen with all paired electrons. This is wrong. This is not the electronic structure of oxygen. We will see the correct electronic structure when we complete the chapter on quantum mechanical bonding. The model also predicts ozone and NO2- to be rings, which they are not, 
And there are some additional failures listed here. Note that none of these are organic entities. We're going to see this list again after we go through valence bond theory, and it will be shorter. We're going to see this list again after we go through molecular orbital theory. Well, actually, no, we're not. Molecular orbital theory actually correctly overcomes all of the limitations of the Lewis Vesper model and valence bond model. However, molecular orbital theory is a very complex theory and cannot be done quickly or be done on paper. In the grand scheme of things, there are actually few shortcomings to the Lewis Vesper model, which is why we continue to use it.